and I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Lowry and switch gears to the mitral valve. Good morning. Uh, well, uh, we're going to talk about uh, some aspects of the mitral valve uh, based on a number of years' work we've done here doing investigations on the basic uh, structure and function of the mitral valve. And this is the product of a team effort here with our cardiologists, imaging people, and uh, basic scientists at the University of Houston. And uh, basically, uh, Dr. Carpentier in 1968 introduced the quadrantic resection for uh, posterior leaflet ruptured cordy based on autopsy studies of 100 uh, dead Frenchmen. And uh, he came up with this uh, fairly uh, standard procedure that most of you have probably been exposed to with a resection of this area and the placement of a rigid ring. Uh, this is still worldwide the most common uh, technique that was developed before any echo was available. Worldwide low repairability rates, poor long-term durability, and this systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral leaflet up against the septum that causes outflow tract obstruction and MR. Despite this, this is still the most common procedure performed worldwide. Uh, national repair rate from the STS database, 60%. Uh, There's been a 6% rise over the last 10 years in repair rate in the United States. So 40% of people in the United States are getting a prosthetic valve. This paper was published in January. This is from the MIDA study, M-I-D-A. Uh, it shows that people operated on for pro, uh, flail mitral leaflet who receive a prosthesis have a 20% lower survival at 10 years than people who are repaired. So 40% of the people in the United States are getting replaced and are experiencing a 20% mortality deficit. So this is a very serious problem we're discussing in every single uh, category of patient did better with repair. This is that. Our repair rates here started off at 12% in 1980, and we're now running over 90%, and for degenerative disease with preserved leaflets, 100% in the last 1,000 patients. Uh, the mitral valve is not really two leaflets. It's not like the aortic valve where there's not a lot of functional changes, but the mitral valve is part of a complex which consists of the left atrium, the mitral uh, valve leaflets, the mitral annulus, the cordy, the papillary muscles, the left ventricle, and the motion of the aortic root. So this is a very complex thing to fix. This is the anatomy. We can look at more of this in the lab. This is the left atrium removed here. We're looking from behind, anterior leaflet, aortic uh, mitral continuity here, which joins the anterior leaflet up to the left coronary and non-coronary leaflets. This is important because there's been a view of the mitral valve as a D-shaped structure like that, but in fact the mitral valve is a more or less oval structure like this because it goes up here beyond the atrial attachment up into this intervalve uh, triangle here between the left coronary and non coronary sinuses. So this is a very important insight that this anterior leaflet really is this whole area here, not from here down. Anterior leaflet, uh, very important because it uh, acts as the posterior wall of the left ventricular outflow tract during systole and it acts as the uh, anterior wall of the inflow tract during diastole. The angle here between the aortic annulus and the mitral annulus is normally about 180 degrees, and preservation of that angle is extremely important to cardiac function because that sets the direction which blood flows in, and normally uh, mitral blood flow flows towards the apex and then from the apex flows straight up through the aortic annulus. This is what the heart normally does. We see in early systole, mid systole, late systole, we get progressive reduction in the size of the ventricle, but at the same time, the mitral annulus is being pulled down 1.5 centimeters, and the circumference of the mitral annulus is decreasing, and the area is decreasing by 30 percent. Uh, so you see here, as that happens, these leaflets get rolled in towards each other. You go from this to this, and again, very important to produce this in your repair. So here, minimal apposition, moderate apposition, and here, major apposition. And here you can see the engineering implications of this. Here we've got stress down here on the uh, mitral valve leaflets and the cordy. And as the coaptation increases through those three phases we looked at and coaptation increases, the stress on the marginal cordy here 
doesn't change. But the stress as at peak systole here, which is very high ultimately, is transferred out to the annulus. And preservation of this mechanism is also very important. We've done studies looking at stress and strain patterns with the University of Houston, and we've been able to show that this is what an abnormal leaflet looks like. That's an anterior leaflet that's flail, and you can see the whole thing, the brown is high stress, uh, very heavily stressed, and here a normal leaflet there's almost no stress. And this is nature's way of coping with very thin structures, very fine cordy. Everything's arranged anatomically to, dis to disperse stress in a way that minimizes stress on these delicate structures. This is the Carpentier technique. This is the quadratic resection that flattens the leaflet, rigid ring that flattens the annulus. And this is the stress patterns on a patient who has had preservation of the three-dimensionality of the mitral annulus and has nice bulging leaflets that can come together well. And uh, so uh, the Carpentier technique failure rates are mostly associated with stress-related phenomena such as calcification, degeneration, chordal rupture, and ring dehiscence where the heart's trying to get rid of this uh, rigid structure that's been stitched to it. This is the famous saddle shape of the uh, mitral annulus. This is the anterior part of the uh, mitral leaflet coming up under the aorta here we were looking at posterior annulus, and you can see the anterior annulus steepens dramatically in systole, and this point here which is steepening is this area here, and this steepening occurs because the aortic root actually undergoes motion from a vertical position to a more horizontal position during systole, and the aortic subvalvular aortic root expands by 12 percent. You can see here the aortic root in uh, systole, uh, as it expands, pushes in the uh, anterior part of the mitral annulus into the atrium, so the outflow tracks wide, and then in diastole, the root collapses and the uh, outflow of the mitral valve is now bigger. And here you can see here the root rocking coming to this more horizontal position in systole. You can see it pushing the anterior mitral annulus here, which pushes that anterior leaflet back. And uh, in this way, it also lifts the anterior mitral leaflet up and away from the interventricular septum down here. So these motions are very important to preserve. And they're often in the category of seven to nine millimeters in diameter. This is an echo study measuring these things. And this, this area here moves up and back seven to nine millimeters during systole in addition to moving downwards. Here's an uh, MRI. And you can see the left atrium here, you can see the mitral leaflets. Mitral leaflets are opening. You can see the cord in the papillary muscle. And you can see that during systole, the whole of the left ventricle is contracting, but the left ventricular outflow tract is opening as its anterior wall is tucked up and back into the left atrium by the motion of the aortic root. There's also another important phenomenon we have to think about preserving, and that is vortex formation at the apex of the left ventricle. Blood coming in doesn't just passively come down and then do a 180. As it comes in, a vortex forms at the apex in late diastole, and this vortex spins clockwise and spins the blood around the apex and out in a very energy efficient manner. Now the SAM we mentioned is still a problem. All the major centers still experience SAM, and uh, they try to minimize it, but actually most of them have actually written it up and reported 10 to 20 percent incidences. can be very difficult to manage, may end up with a reoperation. Uh, it's led to all sorts of attacks on the mitral valve in the form of various chopping up of the mitral leaflets, sliding the leaflets around, uh, just big mess, as our leader would say. Uh, the uh, the cause of SAM has been debated. It used, the big leaflet theory was the prevalent theory that these leaflets are just too big that you're working on and you have to cut them down and trim them down to make them small enough to fit in. But that's totally incorrect. Uh, if we look at this uh, MRI study from Italy, we see that the, uh, when we put a rigid ring down here, which is D-shaped, and therefore it goes down here lower than it should because the place to put the ring is up here, not down here where the D ends we actually produce uh, mitral stenosis and then the ring, uh, because it's rigid during systole, gets pushed back here under the uh, aorta and causes left ventricular outflow tract. And it, oh, as that's happening, the aortic mitral angle becomes more vertical and flow is directed towards the septum. 
So the combination of all these things, mitral stenosis, outflow tract obstruction, and change in position of the leaflet leads to uh, SAM. And so this technique really should be abolished in the interest of humanity. And we actually have a society called PETAL, which has been around for a number of years, People for the Ethical Treatment of Leaflet. And if you want to go online, you can make a contribution to help us with our battle against the French. Uh, so we now look at what happens uh, when we re replace a mitral valve with a prosthesis. We actually get this 90 degree angle here, just like with a rigid ring. And the inflow here goes right up against the septum and pushes there. And then instead of a clockwise rotation, we get a counterclockwise rotation, which is highly energy inefficient because the blood's got to come down and then make its way here and then go out. With a repaired valve, we preserve the vortex. So this is another advantage. And the energetics are better and the blood comes straight out. So the line of attachment of the ring in current thinking is that it should not be here across the D of the top of the leaflet, it should be up around under the valve leaflets here. And it's very easy to do this technically without hurting the aortic valve. So when we do these kind of techniques uh, and use MRI studies pre and post operatively, we find no problem with left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and the aortic mitral angle is preserved. So we've documented this very well in, in a, quite a series of patients who've undergone pre and post op MRI. We've also documented that the motion of the mitral annulus is well preserved. Here you can see pre-op, uh, the flattened out mitral annulus. Here you can see post-op, the Carpentier ring, which is rigid, does not allow any change in the area of the annulus, whereas the valves repaired with a flexible ring preserving normal function undergo a reduction in size during systole, which is what we were talking about, mid-systole, and then get bigger. The mitral annulus gets bigger again in diastole. <coughs> and again, with our colleagues at the University of Houston, we've documented from 3D echo tapes that uh, if you look at a control, you look at the pre-op annulus, which is typically dilated and flattened, and then you look at our post-operative annuluses using our repair technique, it's back to normal. So let's run through quickly how we do a uh, correction of a large flail anterior leaflet, which is the ultimate challenge for the Carpentier group. They have a lot of trouble doing this. And uh, so here we've got our big anterior leaflet. We use artificial cordy number five Gore-Tex. So put it down on the papillary muscle. We bring it up through the leaflet so that uh, we do a double throw in the leaflet so we can slide the leaflet up and down to adjust it. We use a flexible ring that we uh, developed here. Modification of the old Puig's Masana ring. It's flex fully flexible and adjustable. And we simulate the position of the heart by inflating it. And there is a point in the normal cardiac cycle where there's passive filling to the point that everything in the heart gets stretched, the cordy get pulled down, and the leaflets come together. So right before systole, the, the leaflets are normally together. And this is called diastolic locking. And we can simulate that passively by getting a uh, general surgical uh, suction irrigator that pumps four liters a minute. And we blow up the heart at four liters a minute, and we see these leaflets come up, and they go together like that. And that's the basis of how we get a highly accurate positioning of these leaflets in the heart. And you can see here, we've, this is the completion of the repair. We mark the zone of our position we want with dots. And as we blow this up, you'll see that the leaflets really come together in a moment. You'll see them go down and lock together. And you can see this uh, anterior annulus bowing up in that saddle shape. So that's the base of the repair. And here you, you can see a 3D echo showing the aortic root up in here expanding and moving back. That rocking motion, you can see the anterior part of the annulus here clearly being pushed back towards the posterior leaflet. And here you can see how the inflation simulates that in the non-beating heart. A bit hard to see on the little screen there. You can see this part coming up and coming back. Now Barlow's disease <coughs> is a very severe form of myxomatous degeneration and it's characterized by huge floppy leaflets and uh, late systolic MR. These are the characteristics. And you can see here, what's happening here is these leaflets are so huge they're pulling up the papillary muscles and causing MR. So papillary muscle traction is a big part of the pathology of uh, floppy mitral valve in the Barlow's pattern. And here you can see the only thing we had to do here, this is a 55 millimeter ring, the only thing we had to do here to fix it and restore normal papillary muscle motion, see the papillary muscles are going down now the way they're meant to, 
is to put a ring on here of the correct size, usually around 37 or 39 millimeters. So understanding the pathology of Bardot's disease uh, is important if you're going to repair mitral valves. And this is a, an edit, a fairly big editorial we did in 2015, the uh, Journal of Thrashing and Cardiovascular, and I think this sums it up. It is simple but complex, and this is just worth reading if you're interested in mitral valves. Tricuspid valve, we're going to be talking to you some more about, but basically some people show up with TR, uh, if it's at least moderate and the annulus is great, greater than 40 millimeters, the standard uh, recommendation is to repair the tricuspid valve simultaneously. But this is still, to say the least, the topic of active debate. There have been several editorials back and forth just recently about this. Now, my personal experience uh, with mitral surgery is more than 2,500 uh, cases, of which over 2,000 now are repairs. And uh, last year, we, uh, year before last, we published a series uh, where we've achieved 100% repairability uh, using these techniques and principles I've just elucidated. And we now have more than 1,000 consecutive patients with 100% repairability. And uh, that goes across degenerative the kind of stuff you see in senile myxomatous and degenerative and myxomatous and we have a technique for ischemic that works very well and then the ones with damaged leaflets you just can't repair all of them. So freedom from reoperation is 90% uh, at 95% at, at uh, 10 years, 3 plus, 4 plus, 85 to 90% and it's independent of the leaflet. A lot of people have trouble repairing anterior leaflets. All our leaflets have done exactly the same. The Barlow's, myxomatous degenerative ischemic, and the anterior leaflets, uh, I don't think I got the, yeah, here we are, anterior, posterior, both, neither. Uh, they all do the same. So these techniques are one technique for all forms of mitral valve prolapse. Freedom from late prosthesis because we preserve the leaflets. We have a 5% reoperation rate. We can go back in and most of those can be re-repaired re because we've still got leaflets that are okay. There's some further caudal problem has developed. So uh, we've got this website. And in addition, if you go on YouTube last year, uh, 2016, we did grand rounds. With a, there's a one hour version of this lecture with a lot more detail. And it's available there. And then there are a couple of shorter lectures. And then we'll try to touch on some of this stuff again at the uh, session this afternoon. Thank you.